It is now my privilege to introduce tonight's special guests, Dr. Robert P. George and Dr. Cornell West. Although these two esteemed academics live at opposite ends of the political and philosophical spectrum, they share a friendship spanning decades. These scholars share a genuine respect that, as you'll soon hear, they call each other brother. In 2018, they were co-winners of the Open Mind Award for Leadership, granted by the Heterodox Academy. This award recognizes a person or group that has most effectively championed the principles of viewpoint diversity, mutual understanding, and constructive disagreement in the academy and beyond. Dr. Robert P. George. At Princeton University, he is McCormick Professor of Jurisprudence and Director of the James Madison Program in American Ideals and Institutions. He has frequently been a visiting professor at Harvard Law School teaching philosophy of law and related subjects. In addition to his academic service, he has served as Chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedoms, member of the President's Council on Bioethics, been a presidential appointee to the United States Commission on Civil Rights, and the U.S. member of UNESCO's World Commission on the Ethics of Science and Technology. Dr. George is a former judicial fellow of the United States Supreme Court, where he received the Justice Thomas C. Clark Award. Along with so many other recognitions he has earned, he is a recipient of the U.S. Presidential Citizens Medal. He is the author of four books, as well as co-author of several other books. Please welcome Dr. Robert P. George. Thank you, Thank you. <laughs> and they get to wear the Brittany headphones, too. Dr. Cornell West, at Union Theological Seminary, New York City, he is the Dietrich uh, Bonhoeffer Chair. He teaches courses in philosophy of religion, African-American critical thought, in a wide range of other subjects. Previously, he was professor of public, of public philosophy at Harvard University and professor emeritus at Princeton. He recently partnered with Masterclass to provide teaching on several courses on such topics as empathy with Pharrell Williams, with whom I have never co-taught. <laughs> <laughs> black history, black freedom, black love, and philosophy. He has a passion to keep alive the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He has written 20 books and has edited an additional 13 books. We all know him. We're thrilled he's here, Dr. Cornell West. Uh. <laughs> and guiding this evening's conversation is Dr. Ann Hyde, our own superstar. Professor of history. That's yes, right. yes. Professor of history and editor in chief of the Western Historical Quarterly at OU. She is the author of six books, one of which won Columbia University's Bancroft Prize and was a Pulitzer Prize finalist in 2012. Her research and teaching specialize specialties include Indigenous America, the U.S. West, understanding race, and frontier violence. She was just elected vice president of the American Historical Association. We are thrilled they are all here for a point counterpoint. Please take us away. Well, thanks everybody for being here and thanks so much to President Harris for bringing us all together. I think that's really important. I'm so grateful to see so many people here tonight that there are this many people who care about this deeply important issue. We all need a little help in figuring out how to talk to each other. And that's what we do at a university, and these, these guys are gonna help us move down that path. So my job really, really is in 35 minutes to have these two fantastic public scholars, humanists, and you know people who are dedicated to the humanities. And they, you know, as public intellectuals, they model, you know, for us how we might do this. So how does civility work? We're going to model that tonight. But also how hard it is. You have to work at it. And that's a piece of that as well. And it's very important to see why these two brothers in the life of the mind, how they learn to disagree with each other. 
they have to trust each other enough to disagree. So that's, that is quite a trick. So while we're laying out some challenging issues and th you know, thinking through this, and we're going to practice listening and thinking at the same time, this maybe will spur some folks to come up with some questions. Um, so it, as you, you know, think about what we're saying, if you want, if we're going to have 10 minutes at the end to have questions from the audience. But again, my job is just to shepherd this fantastic conversation. We also have some student volunteers who are going to help us be honest about the time. So <laughs> let's just get started here. So given your political differences, how did you meet? And then how did you discover that you actually had common ground? Well, first, uh, let me thank uh, Dr. Harris uh, and his wife, Ashley, uh, and you, uh, Dr. Hyde, Governor Keating and his colleagues in the uh, senior ranks of the administration of the university for this opportunity to be part of this important series and part of these important discussions. I know I speak for Cornell as well as myself in congratulating you on what the university has accomplished in these extremely difficult times and saluting you for doing the kind of thing you're doing here. Whether we're the right two people to be doing it or not, somebody's got to be doing it. And the fact that you're hosting a conversation like this for your students and faculty and staff, I think, speaks volumes about your commitment uh, to the life of the mind. And what a blessing it is, as always, to be with my beloved friend, Professor Cornell West, America's number one public intellectual. Um, and it's a special, special treat to be here tonight with um, his first lady, Dr. Anahita Madhavi West, who's with us. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Cornell and I uh, met when he arrived at Princeton University. Uh, must have been in the early 90s, Cornell, about Absolutely. that. Yeah. Uh, I had started at Princeton just a few years earlier. He had started at Union Theological Seminary, his first appointment after graduate school a few years before uh, that. Uh, when he arrived at Princeton, he and I found ourselves together with many of our colleagues who are interested in philosophy and ethics and political theory uh, in faculty seminars hosted by our Center uh, for Human Values. Uh, now, Cornell uh, made a big success of himself very early, so he was a very important uh, figure when he arrived at, at Princeton, and like um, other uh, admirers from a distance, I was very eager to learn what he was like uh, in person. And uh, I was not disappointed because in those faculty seminars, it was Cornell West who was the guy who was asking all the right questions. He was the guy who would lead us away from narrow, technical, in the worst sense, academic discussions, the logic chopping, the pure conceptual analysis. Not that that's not important to do, but it was Cornell who would be dragging us back to the big questions, the questions of meaning and value, human nature, the human good, human dignity, human rights, justice. How should we live? What does it mean to be a human being? And you would think in a Center for Human Values, those questions would be in the forefront, not the narrow, technical, academic uh, questions. Now, I'll have to confess that I wasn't always so thrilled with the answers that he was giving. <laughs> But he was the guy who was asking the right questions. And you're never going to get to the right answers unless you ask the right questions. Well, we got to know each other, but, but not well. We were friendly acquaintances rather than friends until one day in 2005, one of our wonderful students, a really brilliant student, Andrew Perlmutter was his name, uh, who had been in Cornell's classes and who had been in my classes, showed up at my door during office hours. And he said, Professor George, I'd like to talk with you. I said, happy to talk. What's on your mind? It wasn't uh, uh, anything having to do with the course. Rather, he wanted to tell me about a new magazine that he and some of his fellow students were starting called The Green Light. And the magazine was going to be a student-edited magazine of culture, uh, politics, the arts, um, philosophy. Uh, he described it as our own campus version of, of The New Yorker. Uh, and you know, these kids get uh, something like that into their heads, and they will run with it. 
And I don't know how, it, whether, you know, whether it's the same here, but boy, at Princeton, they'll even raise the money to do it, and that was amazing <laughs> that they, they did that. So I said, well, Andrew, that sounds like a wonderful idea. I wish you well. How, how can I help? And he said, well, in every issue we've decided, beginning with the inaugural issue of the Green Light, we want to have a feature, and that feature will be one professor interviewing another professor. And for our first issue, we have invited Professor Cornell West to be the interviewer. And we asked him to choose someone to interview, anybody on the faculty. And he said that he would like to interview you. Would you be willing to be interviewed by Dr. West? Well, I was flattered to death. I mean, <laughs> I was nobody and he was the great Cornell West. I mean, no, no, what does he no, see in me, no, right? No, no. Uh, so I, I said, well, of course, I'd be delighted uh, to do that. And so the day came and here came Andrew with his cassette tape recorders. You youngsters won't know what a cassette tape recorder is. <laughs> you, you, you record everything with these, uh, these things, right? But uh, it was an old-fashioned device called a cassette tape recorder. Uh, and he had a photographer with him who must have flashed or taken 2,000 pictures over the course of our time uh, together. So Andrew just hit the tape recorder to turn it on, and he looked at Cornell and said, go! And Cornell launched into it wasn't an interview. It was a rollicking, uh, knockdown, drag out, no holds barred conversation about everything contemporary politics, the deepest philosophical questions, religious issues, because Cornell is interested in everything. And so we just kept going. Fine, the tape ran out, and we just couldn't stop. We were, we were, we were going strong. Um, we had started about 2 o'clock. I noticed on my watch, uh, when I looked down once, that it, hit, it was six o'clock. We'd been going for four hours. And so I said, well, Brother Cornell, this has been a wonderful conversation, but look, we've been going for four hours. Uh, I, I need to go home for, uh, for dinner. My wife's gonna be uh, putting out a missing persons uh, report. <laughs> and he said, well, Brother Robbie, this is wonderful. You know, we really need to get to know each other better. Let's get together for lunch and continue this conversation. I said, that would be great, Brother Cornell. Let's do that. And I said, well, walk me down to my car. And we continued the conversation. We walked down to my car parked down on William Street near the Princeton University Press, and I stood there with my hand on the door latch for another 45 minutes while we kept, <laughs> we kept going. And I'll just close this little part of the story by saying how it ended, which is that a few days later, we got, uh, the senior members of the faculty like Cornell and myself, uh, got a uh, message from the dean of the college saying we need more of our senior, better known faculty to teach freshman seminars. We, we proclaim to the world and we try to attract students to Princeton by saying, if you come to Princeton, unlike those other places you may have heard of, um, uh, you're, you're gonna be taught by professors, not by graduate students, and even the freshmen are taught by our most senior and famous professors, but the only problem is it's not happening. <laughs> so we need some of you guys to sign up to be freshman seminar teachers. Um, and so, well, the light bulb went off over my head, and, and I got in touch with Cornell, and I said, Cornell, you probably got the same message that I got from, uh, from the dean. We should just continue that conversation of ours with 18 wonderful, brilliant Princeton freshmen. We'll, we'll do a book a week over the 12-week course of the semester. We'll uh, choose books that have been important in our own intellectual odysseys. We'll have no secondary sources. We'll have the students engaging with the great thinkers of history, Sophocles, Plato, St. Augustine, all the way up to the 20th century writers, John Dewey, C.S. Lewis, Martin Luther King, Leo Strauss, and so forth. And Cornell said, that would be a wonderful idea. And so we did it. We had several hundred students sign up for the seminar. We could only take the 18 because of the restricted number. We wanted it to be a seminar. But from the moment that seminar began, I could tell there was something more than the chemistry there. The magic was there. We were playing off each other and deepening and deepening and deepening the conversation and the students were coming in. And I'd never experienced anything like it in my life. And we continued to teach those seminars until Cornell abandoned me to go to Harvard. Um, for, for which I uh, am still working on forgiving him. Uh, but, and, and then he came back once on leave and we, and we, and we did it again. Uh, but those uh, seminars and teaching with Cornell and our friendship together has been one of the greatest blessings of my uh, entire life. So that's how it happened. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Oh, that's so cool. 
So in that seminar, were there things you disagreed about? Did you figure out, hmm, maybe this isn't so fun on some days? No, I do not recall a moment in our 20 years or so where I in any way regretted the high quality of our human relation, even when he's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but I do want to begin by saying it's a blessing to be in conversation with you. I salute the captain of the ship. Really, he's got a very special spirit. I salute his mother. Mothers are so, so, so special. I salute his wife, the first lady, and of course, my beloved wife. Anahita as well, and also, where's Sister Goodwin? Is Sister Goodwin? There she is. Now, she's from my town. I was born in Tulsa, Oklahoma, so I'm coming home. I'm coming home. And the Goodwin, and the Goodwin family, you knew my grandfather, Reverend C.L. West, who's the founder of Metropolitan Baptist Church, one of the largest churches on the chocolate side of Tulsa. Oh, yes, and then David and Belinda, where are they, the vice presidents? Where are, where are the vice presidents? Give it up for these vice presidents. He's got a whole team. He's got a whole, whole team. And Stacy and all the others, the wonderful regents who are servants of this grand institution. Going back to 1890, that's a long time. <laughs> Oklahoma doesn't become a state until, what, 1907? My God, my God. <laughs> and I think of Ralph Ellison, Oklahoma City. Yeah. Clara Lupa, where's my dear brother Carol? <laughs> Professor Hill, where's Professor Hill? Professor Simon, Professor Simon. These are giants, but I say that because, you see, for me, I am who I am because somebody loved me. Somebody cared for me. And my hunch is, that's true for you too. Mm -hmm. No matter how high we ascend, the status, title, you never forget what they poured into you. So when I ring, and my dear brother, he met my mother. Absolutely. And he knows woman. I'll never be half the person she was. Or Clifton West, who he never got a chance to meet. I'll never be half the human being he was. So it's Samuel Beckett, try again, fail again, fail better. Try again, fail again, fail better. So when I met my dear brother, the first thing that came across to me was not just his brilliance and his intellectual love of the quest for truth and beauty and goodness and the holy, we're both deeply Christian. He's Catholic, I'm hanging loose Baptist, but we'll work that out. <laughs> we'll work that out later. He's got Thomas, Thomas Aquinas working and I got Kierkegaard and some <laughs> Howard Thurman and Martin Luther King Jr. But most importantly for me, it was that he had what is more and more rare these days, integrity, honesty, decency. He said what he meant, and he meant what he said. He didn't go through life posing and posturing and trying to fit in and obsessed with conformity, complacency, and cowardliness. He's courageous, even when he's wrong. <laughs> he's courageous, even when he's right. <laughs> And so we cultivated a relationship in which it became genuine love. And Ahita knows this. He's not a friend. He's my brother at the deepest level. He's a member of my family. If he's sick, I go to the hospital. When I go to jail, which is probably a bit too often, <laughs> he calls to bail me out. Yeah. And I say, I'm broke as the Ten Commandments financially. I appreciate that. <laughs> But love is in no way reducible to politics. And that brotherhood is in no way reducible to political agreement. And we've got to be able to exemplify that to our precious younger generations of all colors and genders and sexual orientations and religious identities. Because our culture and society is so polarized and it's so gangsterized. You said it so eloquently, my brother. I told him you put a smile on Cicero today. You know, eloquence is wisdom talking. That's Quintilian and Cicero, isn't it? That's not an easy thing. Because Cicero went on to say what? 
you lose your democracies when you don't have citizens who are willing to straighten their backs up and courageously say what is on their mind in the form of argument, story, narrative, vision. Or, he plays a serious banjo, <laughs> sing a song. And I, down, I don't want to downplay the arts. Because it may be in our younger generation, so many of our young folk are unchurched and unmosked and unsynagogued. They have a distance from religious institutions. And their last sense of transcendence is music. And music has played a crucial role in preserving the best of American democracy. So the arts are very important. I know, I know the University of Oklahoma understands that. We need to understand that more at Princeton, Harvard, and Yale, yes, Union, we do. Union Seminary, and so forth, you see. Because we are living in some very grim times. And so it's almost sad that they trot us out as an odd couple. <laughs> it's true. And you say, well, what is, what is Thanksgiving like at your house? Does everybody <laughs> politically agree around the table before you hit the turkey? No! No way! Uncle is still living in the 1950s. Mama's on the cutting edge. Your kid's going at you. Everybody's in love. But the contestation is rich and intense. And so all we're trying to do is to keep alive the great Socratic legacy of Athens. The unexamined life is not worth living. And the prophetic legacy of Jerusalem that means much to me and him, but especially for me coming from a black people who've been terrorized but keep dishing out freedom fighters, hate it but not returning it with hate but dishing out love warriors like Carol, Clara Lupa and Martin King, John Coltrane's love supreme. And so prophetic legacy of Jerusalem, that Palestinian Jew named Jesus with our Jewish brothers and sisters generating that magnificent notion of hesed in the Hebrew scripture. The best of the Muslims, Malcolm X. I'm for truth no matter who says it, I'm for justice no matter who promotes it. I am first and foremost a human, a Muslim, and a black man, as Malcolm X, after some development. We know Malcolm had to, he had to grow. Everybody's got to grow. Everybody's got to grow. Shakespeare says rightness is all, nobody's born right. That's what education is. Maturation of a compassionate personality. The formation of attentions. You attend to the things that matter and not the superficial things in life. And the cultivation of a critical orientation with an intellectual humility. That's Socrates. That's Jesus. Not a monopoly. Many other civilizations, many other cultures produce some magnificent figures too. But we tend to be preoccupied with the Socratic legacy, the prophetic legacy that leads toward democratic ways of being in the world. I, know, I don't want to go on too long because we, uh, we've got some other fascinating questions. But I'm simply to say, I'm glad to be here and I love to be with my brother. <laughs> So, so with all that, that kind of tradition, <laughs> Socratic methods, what's wrong in 2023? Why is it so difficult to disagree? What, what has shifted? Well, let's try to get at that question. Mm. Maybe the way to begin is, first, uh, let me just ask uh, the people in the audience here who are infallible. Will you raise your hands, the people who are infallible? Mm -hmm. We got one. We got, we got one over there, yeah. It's the first time I've ever asked that question when I've gotten someone who's raised a hand. I, I always worry that Pope Francis will walk in. <laughs> well, she just meant infallible at this particular moment, but the moment is gone, and she's now fallible once that's again. Right. That's, that's right, that's right. Is that right, my dear sister? Yeah, absolutely, you see? She... Oh, so for the... 749 of you <laughs> who are fallible, tell me this. Are you fallible only on the relatively minor, superficial things in life? Or is it possible that you could be wrong on the big, important, profound moral questions, political questions? 
I think you would all answer the question, my infallibility, my fallibility, <laughs> my fallibility is not limited to the minor unimportant things. It's the human condition that our fallibility extends even to the great questions. And that's why some, many of the greatest figures in history have been wrong about some really, really important things. People who are in so many other ways so deeply admirable, yet wrong on some important things. When we're talking about disagreement and civility and civil disagreement and civil discourse, it's got to begin from a more than merely notional, not just check the box, but a genuine, deep, existential awareness and recognition of one's fallibility. And when you achieve that, then the cash value of that is in a virtue that you develop. And that's the virtue of intellectual humility. And I put it to you, I submit that that is the virtue that is missing today. But it is essential to the functioning and flourishing of two things that ought to be terribly, terribly important to us. One, it's absolutely essential to the flourishing of universities and other academic institutions, institutions of learning. If you already think you know anything, you're not going to learn anything. You have to be aware of your own fallibility. This is how we have made what progress we have made in intellectual life. And that process, that progress is jagged. We, we go forward, but then we fall back. We go forward in one area and fall back in another area. If we're going to make progress in any area, we need that virtue of intellectual humility. The other thing that is so vitally important that we should care about, and that intellectual humility is essential to it, is the functioning of a Republican civil, civic order, a democracy. Without that, democracy will collapse for the very reasons identified by our founding fathers and especially by James Madison in the 10th Federalist Paper. We will fall into faction. Faction so bad and so severe that it cannot be dealt with simply by what the Federalists' authors themselves called the auxiliary precautions of constitutional structures and checks and balances. We need virtue in the people to maintain a democracy. Having a great constitution is important, and we've got one, and we should feel very blessed to have it, but it's not enough. It won't work by itself. Our founders understood this. You need virtue in the people, and among those virtues, central, foundational, is the virtue of intellectual humility. So if we're going to get out of the dilemma that we're in, we're going to have to inculcate that virtue in our students, fellow faculty members, and in our children, fellow parents and grandparents. End of sermon. Absolutely. Absolutely. Did I get any response to that same question? Sure, absolutely. I want to just build on Brother Robbie's point, though. You see, because fallibility and intellectual humility are shallow without courage. Yeah. See, courage is the enabling virtue. All the other virtues actually are vacuous if you're cowardly, if you're just fitting in, if you want to be well-adjusted, the injustice or whatever. Courage cuts against the grain or in the Christian context, what can God do with cowards? Now, God can do all things are possible, so I won't get too theological right now, but courage is more and more being pushed to the margins in our society because courage without generosity hugs the knees in hell. If you are irate, full of indignation, but is not tied to a care and a sensitivity to others, then it's not really courage. The Greeks got other, have other language for it. It could be fearlessness or whatever it is. It's not courage. Courage has a moral and spiritual dimension. The Greeks called it magnanimity. What is magnanimity? Greatness of character. And we are suffering with 
a deep spiritual decay and moral decadence in our society because we don't have enough folk who connect courage with generosity and become exemplary. They become marginal. And what do they see? They see money makers. They see folk obsessed with the 11th commandment, thou shalt not get caught. <laughs> get over by any means. Look at me, look at me, look at me, I'm so successful. Well, I learned in vacation Bible school at Shiloh Baptist Church that worldly success is qualitatively different than spiritual and moral greatness. <laughs> qualitatively different. But all the success in the world might make you a peacock, peacock strut because they can't fly. <laughs> We're talking about spiritual and moral greatness, and what is that? Well, somewhere I read here, she is greatest among you. We be your servants. We'll learn how to serve others. We'll stay in contact with the humanity of others, and to stay in contact with humanity means what? Our wretchedness and our wonderfulness. Most of human history is a history of domination. Subjugation. It's a history of what the great Howard Thurman called the hounds of hell, which are hatred, greed, fear, envy, resentment. We know Dante's great trilogy, yet to be surpassed. Inferno, the Purgatorio, the Paradiso. What do you have to say to us, Dante? Well, Read some Shakespeare. What do you have to say to us, Shakespeare? Read some Tony Morrison. What do you have to say to us, Tony Morrison? Read some Franz Kafka. What's the point? Human beings are wretched too often, and it takes courage for the wonderful potentials of human beings given the wretchedness. So when I look at America, in many ways, I'm not surprised. I've been reading about human beings for a long time. <laughs> human beings are never that impressive. <laughs> And those few moments when you create interruptions in the history of domination and hatred and greed, which are democratic experiments, they tend not to last that long because the citizenry runs out of gas and they become too obsessed with forms of idolatry and money and status and become indifferent. The great Rabbi Heschel used to say indifference to evil is more insidious than evil itself. And we didn't downplay the wretchedness of our own past as well as lose contact with the wonderfulness of our own past. I mean, we in Oklahoma, right? We got precious indigenous brothers and sisters been here a long time, long time. And I know what my dear sister's written magisterial on this. It was not by means of Socratic dialogue that we gained access to the land. And they say, oh, Brother West, that sounds like you're anti-American. No, no. Americans are human beings like everybody else. They have the best. They have the worst. Attend to both. The same would be true with black folks. The same would be true with workers. The same would be true with women and so forth and so on. And this is not politically correct chit-chat. We're talking about wretchedness and wonderfulness. And that wretchedness and wonderfulness cuts across all race, gender cuts across all regions and so forth. It's inside of us. The greed in me, the hatred in me, the fear in me, the envy in me. That battlefield on my soul with the civil war that's taking place every day of my life. That's why me and Robbie, when we teach our class, the students come in, remember what we tell them, Robbie? You all have come <laughs> into this class to learn, learn how, how to, to die. die. And they look yes. at us, oh, this is a freshman seminar, we just wanted to get a grade sooner or later. What, 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 what are you talking about? What are you talking about? One time we said that at parents' freshman Ooh. weekend, and those, oh those parents were not happy to hear that. $75,000 a year to learn how to die. $75,000. My child went to Princeton to learn how to die. And what do we mean? Of course, Plato himself says what? Love of wisdom. Philosophy is the meditation on the preparation for death. Seneca says, he or she who learns how to die unlearns slavery. Yes. Montaigne, the great creator of the essay itself, says to philosophize is to learn how to die. 
and in my own black tradition, you see, where to learn how to love is a form of death because you've got to be able to kill the cowardliness, the fear, the narcissism, and the hedonism at least for a while to be open enough and vulnerable enough to fall in love, to become entangled with another human being so you can walk around a new being now with someone else at least for a moment. Sappho's bittersweet might be waiting for you, but that's all right. You better do love Never to have loved at all, loved and lost, and never yeah. to have loved what we won't get into that right now. But the point is, the point is that we need our students to understand that when they come to University of Oklahoma with this grand tradition, you're not here for cheap schooling. We're not just trying to provide skills so you can get a job somewhere. You're here to be educated, what the Greeks call paideia what the Germans call Bildung. And that means you can get your skill, we want you to have a good job, we want you to be successful, but you've got some ideas of spiritual and moral greatness that you've got to hold on to. And William James, the most adorable of all public philosophers in the history of this nation, used to say education itself is an habitual vision of moral and spiritual greatness. And that's very important. Very important. I know there's a lot of talk about greatness these days in America. And there's a lot of varieties of greatness. <laughs> I won't say anything about my very dear, dear brother Trump at the moment, but he's got a discourse <laughs> on greatness. I said, okay, brother Trump, what kind of greatness you talking about? Ah, <laughs> uh, let us know. Is Alexander the Great or is it Jesus? Yeah. Alexander was great in which way? Could you please break that down, my dear sister? My dear, my dear wife, who's, who's Persian in Iran, I said, dear brother, what? she got Cyrus. And the Persians like to talk about Cyrus. It's in the Bible, he's in Herodotus and so forth. Well, he was an emperor, he was a conqueror too. When I think of greatness, I think of Clara Looper. I think of Rabbi Heschel. I think of Dorothy Day. I think of Deacon Hinton, who was my deacon in Shiloh. I think of the teachers who shaped us. There was a brother here named David Gross who brought me here in 1988. I shall never, ever forget him. Somebody told me he's living in Maine now. I don't know what the relation is to Oklahoma and Maine, but you ought to break that down. <laughs> <laughs> When I think of greatness, I think of those who muster the courage to think critically, be humble, yet also have enough moral tenacity to bear witness before the worms get their bodies. That's what spiritual and moral greatness is about. The very height of what education in all of its broader senses is actually about. And University of Oklahoma, I'm sure, has examples. But you got to highlight those examples because our young people these days, market-driven obsession with celebrity, not too many celebrities who are highly enamored. Meet the standards that I'm talking about. But, but also, they never have. Well, they students need to be armed for Thanksgiving. So when you go home for Thanksgiving yes. and you face your family, that's a tricky moment. Well, you tell them you love them. <laughs> That's the first thing. Yeah, yeah. Then tell them how you're growing. Cornell's talked a lot about the human condition. One aspect of the human condition that I think we should focus on if we're going to talk about Thanksgiving and disagreement and managing disagreement, uh, one feature of human nature is that we tend to be tribal. Now, in some ways, that's a good thing. We're not isolated. We build bonds. That's a, that's a good thing. But it can have a bad side. We're seeing right now the bad consequences for a Republican civic order of tribalism. Another and related aspect of human nature, the human condition, is this. We human beings, naturally, tend to wrap our emotions more or less tightly around our convictions. Again, that in itself isn't bad. In fact, it would not be good if we did not invest something emotionally in our convictions. We wouldn't get anything done. We wouldn't even be able to do the mundane things in life, you know, get the, get the kids up and fed and off to school if we just had the bare beliefs that that would be a good thing to do, but no emotional 
investment in getting it done. A fortiori, the same is true with great causes. You might believe in a great cause, but unless you're emotionally invested in it, you're not going to go out and take the slings and arrows that come and fighting for it. So it's not in itself bad that we invest in our convictions emotionally, but if we wrap our emotions too tightly around our convictions, we become dogmatists, we become ideologues, and it's all too easy to fall into that. And when we do it, notice the following. We will no longer perceive those with whom we disagree, whether it's a disagreement in an academic discussion or a disagreement in politics or a disagreement about religion. No matter what it is, we will no longer see them as fellow citizens, as friends, as family members with whom we disagree in our frail, fallen human effort to get at the truth. We'll not see them as our partners in the truth-seeking enterprise or partners in trying to reach the common good in this republic. We will perceive them rather as what? Enemies. And enemies are not to be reasoned with in the end. They are to be defeated and destroyed. So it's up to us to practice the virtue, to exemplify the virtue, to impart to our young men and women, whether they're students or our children or our grandchildren, the virtue of understanding our disagreements as opportunities to try to get at the truth of things. Understand our interlocutors, our conversation partners, not as enemies, but as friends. When Cornell and I disagree about something, and as, as was pointed out, occasionally we disagree about something. And it can be something pretty important. We don't regard each other as enemies. If somebody as brilliant as Cornell West disagrees with me about something, I assume there must be a pretty good reason for that. And I assume he might be right and I might be wrong. But there's going to be only one way of figuring that out, and that is for us to work together in a dialectical partnership mm. to see if we can get at the truth of the matter. And because I know that he has the same attitude toward me, never regarding me as an enemy to be defeated, but as a friend in the process of truth-seeking, trying to get at the common good, then we are entirely able to trust each other and can be comfortable with each other working forward like that. I know this much. If I only hang around, if I only interact with people who agree with me, they're going to reinforce me in everything that I believe. Now, they're going to reinforce me in the things that I believe that happen to be true, but they're going to reinforce me in every darn thing I believe that is false. And it may be some very important things that I'm wrong about. If we're ever going to swap out the false beliefs in our heads, and I'm going to guess now, unless I've got an exception over here, that every single one of us... <laughs> is there anybody out there with no false beliefs right now? No, <laughs> not even you. Right? So we all know we have some false beliefs in our head right now. If we're ever going to swap out the false beliefs for true beliefs, we cannot only associate with people who will reinforce them in us. We need to engage with people who will question us, question them, those beliefs. And that's how we make progress together. And if someone's helping you get to the truth of things, how in the heck can you regard that person as an enemy? That's your best friend. That's good. That's good. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's see if we have some courageous friends out there willing to ask questions. Well, a lot of things. One is, the relative, <laughs> one is the relative importance of the market, of a market economy. Now, neither of us are ideologues. Cornell is honorary, social, uh, honorary chairman of the, of the uh, Democratic Socialist Party of America. But he's not an ideologue who believes that there's no place for markets and we ought to eliminate markets and have a complete command economy. I believe in the market system. 
but I'm not such an ideologue or an extreme libertarian that I think markets can be or should be unregulated. There are lots of very important reasons to regulate markets. Among them, the need to maintain the market. Because among the things that undermine markets are oligopolies and monopolies that can arise if we don't have a proper a scheme of regulation. So although we disagree about some concrete issues that would come out of how much we want the market to, 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 to be functioning and how much role we think the government has, we're able to disagree about that while at the same time recognizing that there's something to be said on each side of that question. And, and it's very important not to fall into one extreme or the other. Is that, is that Absolutely. Sense, I, mean, I would put it this way, my dear brother, that markets are indispensable but also insufficient for those who are concerned about justice, and I define justice as concerns about the least of these, concerns of the weak and the vulnerable. Now, for me, any talk about justice cuts deep. For any justice that's only justice soon degen degenerates into something less than justice. So for me, I'm talking about love, I'm talking about care, I'm talking about a concern for persons. So for example, I mean, I come from a black folk, right? Well, markets were compatible with 244 years of the most barbaric slavery of modern times. So I say, well, I want to know what kind of markets you're talking about. Brother Robbie comes back and says, of course, I'm abolitionist. When he went to Washington, D.C., he chose the Bible of Harriet Tubman. I was there holding it for him. Oh, I, yeah. I, I was being sworn in as chairman of the of the um, U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, and I was going to be sworn in by Chief Justice Roberts, and so um, I wanted to be sworn in on a Bible that really meant something from a human rights point of view if I was going to be Absolutely. prosecuting this human rights right. cause. And so I got in touch with the Harriet Tubman Museum. She's a great hero of mine. Harriet Tubman Museum in Auburn, New York, and I called us. I'm Robert George, I'm a professor at Princeton University. I'm uh, going to be serving as chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom. I'm going to be sworn in soon, and. Uh, I'd like to know if I could borrow the Bible that I know you have that belonged to Harriet Tubman uh, for, for that occasion. And there was a pause there, and I said, uh, uh, my friend, uh, Professor Cornell West, is going to be. <laughs> she said, we'll have it to you by FedEx tomorrow. <laughs> and, and it gets better. It gets better. So, so. <laughs> Brother Cornell and I arrive at the Supreme Court. We arrive at Supreme Court together. We're, you know the court right up the magnificent marble steps to the marble temple. And we're walking up those magnificent steps. I've got my beloved parents there. They love Cornell. Oh, my parents were there. They are gems. They are uh, my gems. daughter. And we're, we're all walking up. And uh, I've got that great big. Harriet Tubman had a big Bible. I mean, it was under my arm uh, that big. And uh, so we're walking up. I've got the Bible in hand. And we're smiling. And, and all of a sudden, I see the smile go off Cornell's face, and I look over, and there's a police officer, and that police officer's looking at him with a, with a sort of a grim look, and Cornell's looking back at that police officer, and I didn't say anything. We walked on by, we got past there, and then as soon as we were out, out of earshot, just about to walk into the court, I said, Brother Cornell, what was that between you and the, uh, and the police officer back there? He said, well, uh, that's the uh, officer who arrested me when I was protesting down here. To <laughs> <laughs> and, and he said, you know, Brother Robert, now that I've come to think of it, I've never been in the Supreme Court before except to be arrested. <laughs> <laughs> no, God bless him. God bless him. No, they, they, they treated me kindly, but they took me in. They took me in. Oh, absolutely. But I think the point is the important that markets in and of themselves have to be complemented with a whole host of things. You see. And so when I look around and see homelessness, when I look around and see 39% of the black children, 23% of children living in poverty, when I look around and see so many people don't have access to housing, health care, I said, no, something else is needed other than those markets. Those markets can generate technological innovation. They can generate a whole host of forms of creativity. Crucial. But something else is needed, regulation, strong civic institutions that are countervailing forces against markets, because markets, in the end, will sell and buy anything. So you have to have some moral and spiritual criteria that will intervene, especially when it comes to issues of poverty and so forth. And, and that's the kind of, no, the, the interesting thing is he probably is a kind of conservative brother who is deeply concerned about poverty. 
I don't know if a lot of his fellow conservatives really get that memo. No, no, they do. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, some of them do and some of them don't. You know what I mean? It's like, well, what of your priorities? I'm going to start where, talking about the left and Castro oh, and Mao Zedong oh, if you no, keep no, this no, up. Oh, no, no, no. The left, we got our problems. <laughs> now, we got our problems. But, but the important thing is, the important thing is, is that you just want to make sure that, the, that there's a criticism and a self-criticism tied to something bigger than he, him, me and him. And that big, what's bigger? The dignity of the people, the suffering of the people, the cultivation of the children, the sustaining quality relations of community. Those things are bigger. And in that sense, we might have to use markets, we might have to use civic institutions, we might have to use the nation state, whatever it is. So it's always much more complicated than the more narrow, the more narrow, narrow perspective. And that's a really important point because, you know, you, you, those of you, Governor, Keating and the others at the table, you gentlemen. And, and anybody who's just paying attention knows, especially people who've been in politics, issues are hard, mm -hmm. right? It's not, if everything was easy, we'd probably agree about everything. But things aren't easy, things are hard. It's easy to make mistakes. Reasonable people of goodwill can't agree, uh, can't, uh, can't agree on everything. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a wonderful uh, motto that the organization called Heterodox Academy, which was mentioned earlier has, Heterodox Academy's motto, it's an academic reform group, their motto is, great minds do not always think alike. And the reason for that is that issues really are hard. Absolutely. And I think most questions, not all, they're, they're, sometimes we disagree in this country about ends, and those are the hardest questions, but an awful lot of our disagreements, the majority of our disagreements, are not about ends, they're about means. And the history of our country and the history of humanity is that decisions about what means will actually work or work best, or what means, although they give us a quick fix, have long-term adverse consequences, those issues are never really clear. They're hard. The most we can do is kind of make an informed guess or a bet about them. So, so we think that building this agency and giving this agency a certain authority will overall and in the long run serve the common good, but we can't give anybody a guarantee of that. And the people who are saying, it's too dangerous, don't build that agency, don't vest that much power in this agency, they probably have a legitimate concern. Now that doesn't dictate mm. an answer. And that's why we have a democratic process. We wouldn't need democracy if people agreed about everything. We'd have consensus. But democracy is the best way we know of to deal with the fact that reasonable people do disagree. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, that was nice. That was nice. One more question. Okay. race theory in the state of Oklahoma. How do you think we can circumvent these types of bills that try to restrict conversations at our universities? And just overall, what is your opinion on these bills that are kind of sweeping the nation right now? Oh, yeah, indeed, indeed, indeed. Indeed, indeed, indeed. Yeah, I think, again, that uh, we have all have to attempt to make a courageous commitment to our fallen, finite quest for truth and justice. It doesn't have to be called a theory at all. We're concerned with truth and justice. No one theory has ever had a monopoly on truth. You know, that wonderful letter of the great Henry James to the less great Robert Louis Stevenson. No theory is kind to us that cheats us of seeing. No theory is kind to us that cheats us of seeing. Every theory, just like every lens, has some splinters in it, shortcomings, myopia. That's why we need a conversation. So that people say, well, we can't teach critical race theory. Does that mean then that you're no longer concerned about truth and the condition of truth is to allow suffering to speak and you try to tell a story of American history without saying any serious 
truths about U.S. slavery and Jim and Jane Crow and lynching and discrimination and dropping bombs in Tulsa and so forth and so on. What are we talking about here? This is true. This is true. So on the other hand, you know, if the theory is saying, well, there's been there's never been any vanilla people who were concerned about black people. There's never been any white people who were fundamentally committed to truth and justice. Quit lying. That's not true. Well, Fess West, uh, you're leaning toward critical race theory. I don't care what you call it. I'm involved in a quest for truth and justice. That's all. That's what it is. Well, you think that all the black, black folk got all the good stuff in terms of music? This brother plays a serious banjo. It comes from Africa, but it doesn't sound like he grew up on the chocolate side of town, you know? <laughs> he plays serious banjo. No! You got some serious musicians who didn't grow up on the chocolate side of Oklahoma. It's a, it's a human thing. Creativity flows in a variety of different forms. That's truth and justice. Truth is bigger than all of us. It's a jagged edge. It cuts against us and it cuts against others. And we got to teach our young folk, no one theory is going to deliver it all. No matter what theory it is. But when you reach the point where people start banning books, and of course, Brother Robbie has been, he's been involved in the case down in Florida mm -hmm. because they couldn't even use concepts that are, div that, that are dividing. What the was the formulation of concepts, yeah. Divisive concepts. Yeah, divisive concepts. I think that's one of the cases you're probably uh, talking about. So I do teach critical race theory. I teach economic analysis of law. I teach natural law theory. I teach the theory known as legal positivism. Um, I teach what's known as critical theory, the theory associated with the Frankfurt School. Yes, yes. Uh, Cornell and I together teach Marx. We've taught the Communist Manifesto. Uh, together in our seminar. Frederick Hayek too. But that's the point. We don't just teach Marx, we teach Hayek, the great critic of Marxism. That's right. And we teach them both fairly because we want students to understand why great thinkers have come to different conclusions, why theories that may seem abominable to me have had serious followers, intelligent people have follow them, even if I think misguidedly. So I think that we should never ban the teaching of a theory. Now, there are crank theories, and you have to make judgments of quality, and even those you can get wrong, but I can't teach every theory of law. So I have to make the decisions about which are the more credible. But that's the kind of decision that a faculty member ought to be able to, uh, to make. Now, Cornell and I are both founders of the Academic Freedom Alliance. And that alliance finds that we have threats to academic freedom both inside, coming from inside academic institutions and coming from outside academic institutions. Those coming from inside academic institutions these days tend more often to not than not to be coming from the left. Those coming from outside tend more often than not to be coming from the right, very often from politicians or people in politics in very red states. Cornell and I are opposed to restrictions on academic freedom, no matter what the reason is and no matter whose ideology is behind it. We've got to... Mm -hmm. We need open as well as civil discourse. We need open discourse. That is all possibilities, all credible claims on the table. But we also need to avoid indoctrination. I would be very culpable if I taught only one theory, exposed my students to only one theory, no criticism of that theory, no alternatives to the theory. Where that goes on, that should be condemned. But equally, it should be condemned when a theory that reasonable people of goodwill have found credible is by operation of law or just by operation of practice excluded. Our students really deserve to hear what reasonable people of goodwill have thought and said about the big issues 
no matter where they cut ideologically. That, that's what it means to serve our students. Our fundamental job, our vocation, is to serve our students. And that means that we have to give them the best arguments that have been advanced on all sides of questions and then leave it to them to decide by the exercise of their own intelligence where they think the truth lies. Well, I think aiming for truth and justice is a great place to end. So thank you. Oh, thank you. That was wonderful. That was wonderful. Thank you. Wonderful. Wonderful. All right, let's all remain standing because it won't last a whole lot longer. I do want to say something about which I'm very proud, and that is this past year, not just our Board of Regents, but also our faculty senate endorsed that on this campus, on all three of our campuses, that we adopted the Chicago Statement of Principles on free speech. Absolutely. I don't know about you, but there are very few evenings when I've been able to engage in this sort of an intellectual feast that also forced a great deal of introspection, right? This message is important not just for us, but to proselytize this to all of those that are the reason for which we are here. We are beyond thankful. Let's thank our speakers once again. This was a true joy. I also want to thank Kyle Harper for his work in bringing our speakers here as well. I needed to note that. Thank you, Kyle. All right, and speaking of the arts, we are going to end with the arts, which I hope will connect us to our larger selves and our spiritual selves. At this time, I want to invite Nolan Riggins up here to sing the OU chant, which is how we traditionally end these events. Whoa, that was scary. He's right there. He is a senior majoring in multidisciplinary studies. He is from Moore, Oklahoma, and a member of the OU Men's Glee Club. Please welcome Nolan Riggin. Beautiful by day and night, of colors proudly gleaming red and white, neath a western sky, OU's chant will never die. Live on university.